Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for changing the narrative on Black culture and health in this new health decade. You know, I'm Vanessa Seal, and this is one of those topics that's dear to my heart. Uh, a matter of fact, um, my deputy director, Pamela Price, we were deciding who was going to facilitate it because we are both excited about this session. And we have a great lineup of presenters and we're gonna be talking about what do we need to do? What changes do we need to do to get us down the road? When we get to road, you know, the roadmap 2030 that we're rolling out, when we get 10 years down the road 2030, where do we wanna be? We know where we wanna be, but how do we get there? How do we get there? That is the, 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 the question for today. What, where, how do we get where we want to go? We have uh, Dr. Jonathan Jackson, the founder and executive director of Community Access, uh, Recruitment and Engagement Research Center, Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Boston. Uh, I call him Professor. And we have Dr. Cindy Hankerson, a psychiatrist, uh, assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University. We have Reverend Milton Williams Jr., the pastor of Pennsylvania Avenue AME Zion Church in Baltimore. And hopefully joining us soon will be Caroline Randall Williams, author, historian, artist, poet, and professor. And we're just going to have a free flowing conversation uh, today. I'm going to let all of um, the, the, I'm going to start out with the professor. Um, uh, just talking, you know, we just talk a little bit about, you know, we know we have some, when it comes to black culture, you know, we, we have some points where we're stuck, you know, we're stuck in, in our traumas, we're stuck in our religious dogma, we're stuck in how we eat, it, we're just stuck, but we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about where we're stuck, we're going to spend time on this hour, where, how do we get where we are going? So I'm going to be quiet because I can talk all day and I'm going to send it over to Dr. Jonathan Jackson, who I call our professor. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. P. And uh, hello to everyone. Uh, you made it to the end of, uh, of another, uh, I think, really exciting day here at Healthy Churches 2030. Um, and so now I think it's a good time to, to look to the future. Uh, to talk about what's next. How do we get to where we're going? Um, but let me, let me start off by saying where I hope we can go. Um, and, and I think that you know, part of what we need to do is we need to be inspired um, by the people that came before. We know that in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, we were on a civil rights movement. We wanted to, to have access to our basic civil rights. I think the time is, is now and the time has come for a new movement, one that is focused on health and wellness. I think that we have a basic right to be healthy and well. And uh, come here, my, my daughter wants to say hello. Hi. And uh, she wants to be famous. So she, she decided to come to the Healthy Churches 2030 event. Okay, all right, thank you. Bye, I'll come and see you in just a minute. That's great, that's great. <laughs> right. um, but what I was just trying to say is, um, that when we, when we focus on health and wellness as a fundamental right, as something that is, you know, we deserve to have, then we start to see where we need to go. We, need to, we understand that we need to get healthy. Uh, we'll hear from Dr. Hankerson about how we get our minds right. Uh, we need to talk about how to get our bodies right. We also need to talk about how to get our communities right. Uh, and so we've got experts on all three of those. Uh, so, you know, re the Reverend, the good Reverend will be talking about our communities. We'll be talking about our minds. I'm here to talk about our bodies and what we need to do to, to, to set that up for the future uh, in order to be well. Now, there's lots and lots of things that we have learned about individual behaviors that we need to change. We know that we need to, uh, you know, we need to eat healthy. We need to recognize that our, our plates need to be comfortable, uh, colorful. And maybe those portion sizes need to be a little bit smaller where we can get them that way. Um, we understand that uh, we should embrace diets like the Mediterranean diet or the Mind Dash diet um, that, uh, that emphasizes things like, like not quite as many, like, not, like, not quite as much red meat. Uh, we know that uh, we gotta think a little bit about substituting um, uh, you know, those, 
those heavy oils, uh, those animal fats for, for, uh, uh, for things that are, I think are better choices, uh, like embracing olive oil and coconut oil. Uh, we know that we need to get exercise. We need to move our bodies around. Now, these things are not always easy to do. We might live in a neighborhood where it's hard to get fresh fruits and vegetables. We might live in a place where it's not possible to safely exercise on a regular basis. So we got to make sure that we're organizing, not just our, ourselves uh, and not just our families, but in our communities to make sure that we have access to that. Um, lots and lots of people are, are using this pandemic to talk about uh, a new concept called the 15 minute city. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard about that. The 15 minute city recognizes uh, that the majority of our needs as a community should be within a 15 minute walk from our homes. And if we can strive for those kinds of goals to make sure that we have access to good food, to good company, uh, to, to exercise in fresh air, uh, environments that, uh, that are pollution free, um, then we can certainly be on the road uh, to enjoying not just the civic rights, um, but the, that inalienable right, not just to be healthy, but to be truly well. Uh, now, there are other things that we have to shift. There are things beyond our bodies, beyond our communities um, that look to the, the larger systems and sectors uh, that intersect all around us. And unfortunately, we can either need to invent new systems uh, that completely leave those behind. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to have to engage with those systems. One of those systems that I'm talking about uh, that nobody likes talking about, but is in the news all the time, is thinking about clinical research. Right now, clinical research is how we get better as people. This is the system that we leverage in order to, de to design cures. And it's a system that has haunted and harmed uh, communities of color uh, for the last 200, 250 years. Now, instead of ignoring that system, we need to do a better job of holding that system accountable. We need to insist that cures, treatments, um, and effective medicines work for our communities without putting our communities at risk. And the only way to do that is to engage directly with those systems. Now, it doesn't mean you need to be a research subject. It doesn't mean you need to be a lab rat. There are other ways of participating. There are uh, uh, groups called institutional review boards. There are community advisory boards that govern how research is shaped to, to be sure that it is mindful of the things that we need in our communities. And beyond that, we need to engage with broader health systems in general and insist that the same uh, uh, privileges, that the same possibilities exist in our community health centers as they do in the big box hospitals uh, that may be operating down the street. So we, we have to strive for equity and equality and our, our basic health rights at every stage. And it is not gonna be easy, but I promise that you know, if you listen to us, if you organize with us, and if you hold each other accountable, we'll just about get there. Thank you. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much. But how do we, how do we as everyday people get on those boards? You know, uh, is there some training that we need to, you know, create to, to talk about how do you get on the boards? How do people outside of your clinical research industry, you know, how do you find us to get on the boards? I agree with you wholeheartedly, but how do yeah. we do that? Yeah, so, so, you know, it turns out that these boards, you know, the, the ones that I was talking about, these community advisory boards, these institutional review boards, um, they require community members to serve. Um, you know, it's a legal requirement that people who do not have research training uh, be involved uh, in, in both of these groups. Now, institutional review boards or IRBs, um, they are designed uh, to, to make sure that research is ethical and that it is safe. And if the IRB doesn't say yes, if they say no to a study, it does not happen. And if something happens that the IRB doesn't know about, the study gets shut down. Um, there is really, really strict enforcement on these kinds of groups. Now, every local um, uh, health center or academic research center, every university has access to an IRB. So, so the, the odds are good that there is one near you. And um, any IRB that is halfway decent will have a good website that you can look for. So you search for IRB, you can search for Human Research Protections Office, and you can get on these, these boards. Now, they don't pay a lot. Uh, you know, you can't quit your job and serve on an IRB, um, but it is a great way of giving back to your community and making sure that research uh, works for your community and for people who look 
like you and people who have your backgrounds. Now, I, you know, I don't want to harp on about research. This is what I do for a living. But um, honestly, the reason why a life expectancy gets better, the reason why people with privilege and power have been getting healthier, the reason why a certain uh, a certain person who is no longer going to have a job in January um, was able to recover is because of clinical research. Um, and we have to recognize that even though the system wasn't built for us, uh, we can take advantage of its promise and its power uh, to really make sure that in 2030, every single one of us uh, is living a, a happier, healthier existence. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off this in a minute and take it to Dr. Henderson to talk about the mind, the mentality, the, the trauma we live with. But before I go, you know, um, what do we what do we do when you know we some some of us today don't even know about Tuskegee you know we we keep throwing Tuskegee out and with COVID nineteen you know we say one thing in public but in the, but in the vaccine I'm not taking that vaccine you know and 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 because of Bob and Gilead, we are very much involved having conversations with our uh, uh, partners around you know getting African Americans um, in more clinical studies around COVID. But oftentimes, Dr. Jackson, the, 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 the studies have started. And then they come to us and say, oh, we're not getting no black people. But you, why did you call us in, in, the, in the front? So I'm kind of on two different roads here. One, how do we deal with, you know, you started the study without us. And now you need to come to us, Johnny come late me and get black mm -hmm. folks in the study. And at the same time, we're dealing with black culture, changing the narrative on black culture. Black culture, we're like, nah, uh uh, not taking the vaccine. Nope, not doing it. What do we need to do at the organic level of our culture to get us to those boards and to take the vaccine and other, and other kinds of treatment? Yeah, so I mean, I, I completely agree. If, if you don't see people who look like you involved in the design of the study, uh, involved in participating in the study, don't, you know, don't participate. Um, you know, I think you can you can vote with your feet. Uh, refuse to be involved unless you see somebody that you trust, unless they give you answers that satisfy you. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we need to be blind to all of these issues. What I'm saying is that one and all, if we can be uh, unified with one voice and say, this cannot happen anymore without us, uh, then we will be in very good positions. Now, what is happening in the research world, um, you know, because of COVID-19, in the last week, two major organizations have released guidance documents to try to encourage more diversity in research. Now, these are just suggestions, but it is, this is something that the entire industry is trying to pay more attention to. Uh, and they have lots of power and privilege and lots of incentive to not do this the right way. So what I would say is whether you are going to be on an IRB, whether you're going to be in a community advisory board, whether you're going to do your own research in your own community, whether you're gonna set something up and whether you're gonna participate in a research study, no matter how you engage with this sector, make sure that it's done right. And if it's not, tell them exactly why and walk away. Um, you know, I completely understand why some people are, are unwilling or really worried about a COVID-19 vaccine. These trials have been more diverse than 99% of all research studies, but you know, it still has been done in a way where uh, you know, the, the folks of color are an afterthought. And what we need to do is we need to say that's not acceptable. Uh, and we can vote by we can vote with our feet by you know refusing to be involved um, by saying you know we're not going to do we're not going to take a vaccine until we know that it's safe. Uh, and by making that very very clear as individuals as communities um, as community leaders, uh, then that is that is how systems will change. Uh, I shout at the top of my lungs every day, and I have done for years about how this world needs to change for clinical research. Uh, they've gotten used to me and they know how to ignore me. Uh, but it, we've got 321 people on this, on this call. If everybody wrote a one sentence email to the Food and Drug Administration or to pharmaceutical organizations uh, or to researchers, um, if everybody wrote a one sentence me, uh, email today, right now, if we, if we ended this webinar 10 minutes early so that people could do that, the system would change. Um, so it's not like we need hundreds of thousands or millions of people uh, to make a change like other social issues. It honestly just takes a few dozen uh, people who are rising up with a loud voice and saying the same thing. So if 10 of y'all could send me an email, uh, we could get the system changed in a year. 
Um, if 100 of you do it, we could probably do it by the end of the year. It doesn't take much because people do listen um, to new voices, not folks like me who have been around. Well, make sure you put your that email that you want these folks to send to in the chat, please. All right. Um, I know we're going to run out of time. So let me go <laughs> over to Dr. Sidney Hankerson, because Dr. Hankerson, you know, we are a trauma informed people. We are traumatized every day. I'm traumatized, my 16 year old traumatized, my mama was traumatized, my grandmama, my granddaddy. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? <laughs> well, Dr. Pr Dr. Pernessa, let me just first say uh, thank you uh, for convening this just amazing conference and for the opportunity to speak with such distinguished panelists as Dr. Jackson and Reverend Williams. Um, I, I, to answer your, your first question, I, I think the thing that we have to do, you know, in the Black community to promote health so that we will reduce disparities in 30 years, one of the things we have to do is fundamentally transform how we talk about, think about, and seek care for mental health problems. And I think that the Black church is uniquely positioned to be a lead in this transformation. So the reason you know um, that the church is so uniquely positioned is that our churches have been our therapists and our counselors for centuries. Um, you know there was a there was a, a study that came out almost 20 years ago that showed in the United States, regardless of a person's race or ethnicity, when a person is first experiencing depression or anxiety or substance use they first seek help from a clergy person. And we know that in our community, folks like Reverend Williams are especially trusted. Pastors are frontline mental health professionals because we have the highest rates of church attendance in the country, because 53% of African-Americans attend church at least once a week, and because we are um, the most highly religious group in the country. So our churches are uniquely positioned to address mental health problems in this country. And I believe that we've talked at length about COVID. We've, we know how disproportionately we as a community have been impacted by COVID. We, you've talked so eloquently about the trauma that we face in dealing with systemic racism every day that George Floyd's murder did not highlight or did not you know, bring to light, but showed a reality that we deal with every day. And all of that impacts of racism and all of the other social determinants of health that we talk about does impair our mental health. And in the context of COVID, I think there are especially several crises that I wanted to address. One, the rates of depression and anxiety and um, substance use in our community have spiked, have gone through the roof over the last six months. Two, for the first time in our country's history, Black boys between the ages of five and 12 have higher rates of suicide than white boys. And so our children are actually killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk about mental health and suicide, we used to think that was something that only white people do. Mm -hmm. But these mental health challenges and this trauma that we're experiencing have filtered down to our children. And lastly, another crisis that has hit our communities but is not getting the attention that it deserves is the opioid crisis. Black New Yorkers, Blacks in urban settings now have higher rates of opioid overdose deaths than white folks do. It's largely linked to fentanyl. So it being linked, it's a synthetic opioid that is laced in other substances. And so these are crucial issues in our community. And I believe that churches are uniquely positioned to address it. And so I think that one thing that we have to acknowledge is some of our distrust of mental health professionals, our distrust with the healthcare position in, in general, but also how sometimes our own faith and our own religious dogma can contribute to folks in our community not, not seeking care. I'm the son of a Baptist deacon and my mother played the piano for the little kids choir for, for me growing up. So I was in church every Tuesday for choir rehearsal and every Sunday for service. And growing up, I heard as people were talking about their emotions, we just kind of have these knee jerk reactions. Oh, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Or I'm too anointed to be disappointed. And so I think that we have to acknowledge when we are feeling depressed, acknowledge when we are feeling anxious, acknowledge when we may be 
um, instead of just having a wine, a glass of wine for dinner, as our doctor told us, we have the whole bottle. That that we these are mental health challenges that we need to deal with, and so what we've attempted to do, you know, in this road of transformation is a couple of things. You know, to Dr. Jackson's point, there is tremendous distrust of research. So I wear two hats professionally. I see, I see patients at a clinic in Harlem, and then I work with pastors throughout New York City, in Harlem mostly, also some in Brooklyn and the Bronx. And we have focused on right now addressing depression. And so we were very fortunate to get a, a large study from the National Institutes of Health that's gonna be working with over 30 churches in their health ministries to train people from the health ministry to go through an eight week process of becoming community health workers. Um, and in that community health worker training, they're gonna be I, trained how to screen people and support people with depression and how to provide you know, motivational interviewing, which is an evidence-based type of, of support and therapy that helps people understand some of their barriers as well as their strengths and potentially seeking mental health treatment. And so we are going to be working with over 30 churches in New York City to do that. So I think leveraging the trust that churches have is invaluable and leveraging the, the trust and, and, and training up our, our deacons and our choir directors who can be on the front lines and work collaboratively with our pastors so, to support people who are dealing with trauma and depression is crucial. Another thing that we've done is we've created a community advisory board of pastors, of mental health professionals of color, of folks from the New York City Department of Health to work collaboratively on how we can create sustainable structures within our cities and in partnerships with faith-based organizations for how to address some of the systemic racism that we know causes uh, two disparities in health and mental health in particular. And lastly, I think it's just important for us to share. I think if Reverend Williams got up on Sunday and talked about the importance of mental health, it would have a much greater impact than I or Dr. Jackson or you, Dr. Seal, ever could. Absolutely. So I think our pastors are uniquely suited, especially now as our communities are just ravaged with grief um, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic uh, of leading the charge and promoting social justice around mental health. Because again, as I said, our children are dying. Our people are dying from depression and overdose. And I think that as we transform this, we can improve health in our community. And in closing, I'll leave you with my favorite scripture uh, in the book of Romans chapter 12, uh, the apostle Paul said, do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I believe that as we talk about mental health in the church, it's often countercultural because of historical injustices. We've often had to keep things in the house or in the church. But I think as, as we open up Pandora's box and talk, talk openly with vulnerability, vulnerability and with transparency, we will transform our minds, we'll transform our communities and we'll transform the next generation. Thank you so much. You know, uh, I've been, you know, we've been working together and I know your work so, so closely. And I know all these folks are saying, okay, you're talking about working in Harlem. One, I don't work, I don't, I don't, I don't live in Harlem. So what about my church? What about, you know, Reverend Williams Church down there in Baltimore? How can we, you know, get in, get a, get in, get in this? And second of all, what is the criteria for churches to be in your program? Because I know some of you, I, I, you know, we, we, you sending folks to the church and the pastor who has not had any training thinks right. that he is the therapist. Right. And, um, you know, some folks have really got, went, have gone crazy going to their pastor as therapist. So what's the criteria for being in your program? And is there opportunity for churches outside of New York? Well, uh, first of all, in terms of the criteria, right now uh, we are recruiting community health workers specifically from churches who are members of the health ministry. And so the pastor has to nominate them. Um, so it really goes again in line with understanding that pastors know their flock, uh, they're the leaders of the congregation, and they have a real pulse on who should be, you know, providing this type of, of service and, and therapy and connections to care. 
Um, so in terms of, you know, expanding our reach, you know, uh, Pranessa, I look to you and say, let's do it. You know, let's, let's take this it. thing nationwide uh, so that we can, can build up a, a whole force of uh, what I like to call not only trauma-informed churches, but also mental health informed churches as well. Well, we well, let's just go ahead and do it. Let's just let's do, do it. it. Pastor, Pastor Williams, you know, you, you we, we've set you up real good here. Um, but you know, I uh, and 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 folks, we hopefully we'll have some have some time for you to uh, get some questions uh, answered. Um, what what does the church? Let's talk. Let's talk to the church. What do we have to do in our church culture? Lord have mercy. What do we have to do to get us healthy by 2030 and not depend on, you know, we, we're going to depend on Jesus, we, you know, but at some point in time, I really, I really, you know, I was laughing with you all about when I get to heaven, I'm going to rest. Well, I need to get some rest tonight. You know, um, I, 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 I don't want to die tonight. I, I want to live a long life. But yet I talk about I'm going to wait till I get to heaven to get some rest, you know, uh, that getting a crown and all that's real. That is still real uh, because I grew up in that culture. I grew up and you just work yourself. You're going to be all right. It's going to be you can be crazy. It's going to be grief. Uh, whatever you're going through, it's going to be all right in the morning when you wake up in Jesus name in heaven. Reverend Williams, how do today in this moment, in the 21st century, we have, who we've been pouring, this has been pouring in us for generations. What do we need to do now, Pastor, to move our people to another place where we can enjoy health and wellness in heaven right here on earth? All right, wow, that's a huge question, uh, but uh, I'll do my best to, to unpack it in the time that we have. Uh, firstly, Dr. Seal, thank you again. Such an awesome panel that you set up. And of course, Healthy Church is 2030. 2030 and what was 2020 is uh, continuing to unfold and do great uh, and wonderful uh, a ministry, if you want to call it that, but exposing our people to so many uh, important things that have to do with our health. And I'm so grateful to be joined with uh, my dear brothers here that I just uh, here recently met and, and made fast friends with Dr. Hankinson and Dr. Jackson. So uh, I'll do my best to, 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 to help out with that. Uh, and I'll start by saying there is something to be said, Dr. Seal, about um, involvement in church life and in uh, the pressing of one's way through uh, the challenges of day-to-day -day ministry and church life and work. Uh, it certainly is challenging and working with our people can, of course, bring another dimension of uh, difficulty in certain ways, but uh, there's something to be said for uh, one looking beyond uh, just themselves. And in the moment, it's, it's, it's uh, scientifically proven that those who uh, involve themselves in causes bigger than themselves uh, uh, are able to uh, fight their way through and be sustained through challenges in their health. But I get your point that certainly we want to move beyond just kind of surviving the day uh, to moving to a place of, of real health. So as a pastor here in Baltimore, Maryland, I can mention some things that I think are important and that can probably be, be extrapolated out to other portions of the country. Uh, just pastor a little church in Baltimore, it's, uh, it, it would be hard for me to talk about uh, you know, what healthcare is all about and where we go as a church and what that means for us culturally with just out kind of uh, mentioning some of the disparities that of course we're all dealing with that have come through many years of uh, health inequity and systemic disparity. So uh, in a place like Baltimore with the mortality rate that it has declined, thank God over the past decade uh, since 2020, uh, but still has an adjusted uh, an age-adjusted mortality, mortality rate of 40% higher than the rest of our entire state and ranks last on key health key healthcare outcomes to other jurisdictions in Maryland, uh, we definitely have some work to do. Uh, th this reality, though, is compounded by a series of complicated systemic, social, political, economic, and environmental obstacles. And so with more 
uh, than one in three children living below the federal poverty line and more than 30% households earning less than $25,000 a year, uh, income, poverty, and race uh, have an enormous impact on health outcomes across neighborhoods like in Baltimore and elsewhere, I'm sure. Uh, so the state of health uh, in Baltimore, and I'm, I say that to say this, the state of health is especially urgent when we consider that Baltimore houses some of the best healthcare institutions in the country. Johns Hopkins is right, uh, uh, right down the street from us. And uh, yet uh, we have some of the deepest challenges. I say that to say again, that uh, healthcare alone cannot um, drive good health. And so, which kind of uh, comes to where uh, I think some of my comments might be useful. So uh, when we're talking about this narrative, changing the narrative, narrative on black culture and health, as we know, culture, it encompasses the social behavior and norms found in human societies, as well as knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, habits of the individuals in these groups, uh, and all, basically all that goes into us being us. Uh, it was touched on earlier, but uh, there's a cultural distrust that uh, people of color, Black folk particularly, have with uh, healthcare. Uh, the industry from the very beginning has disregarded people of color. Uh, you touched on the Tuskegee experiment uh, that without knowledge and permission, people were thinking they were getting helped, but actually, actually they were getting harmed. Uh, when you talk about uh, that kind of disregard for human life and community, it certainly is part of our cultural distrust and dissatisfaction we have around healthcare. Uh, not going on, a sister named Henrietta Lacks died at 31, went to the hospital because she wasn't quite feeling right, ends up they start to uh, uh, start to mess with her cervix, they're doing experiments on her body, uh, all without permission. Again, so when you bundle all that up with the fact that we've always been a resilient people, strong people, have strived to live and have had to fight for our humanity against a system that did not properly regard us, uh, that only valued us to the extent that we could contribute to their prosperity. Uh, out of this painful heritage, you know, we had to exhibit, uh, you know, the agency to define ourselves. So in the, in the attempt to do so, uh, greatness has shown forth in so many different ways. We're a beautiful and awesome people, yet in, in some, some not so great ways uh, have come with that, but all developed in our yearning to survive. And so we have a culture that on the one hand esteems and honors brotherhood and sisterhood, community, but in some inst instances celebrates violence against one another. We hear that in our music and otherwise. We have a huge violence problem, which is also a healthcare problem here in Baltimore, probably for the, uh, probably for, uh, uh, the fifth year in a row, I know for about four years in a row, we were up over 300 murders and um, uh, homicides, and we've been on that trajectory, and it's very, very painful. Uh, but, you know, so, but at the same time, we uh, have a culture that loves our women. At the same time, we tolerate sometimes misogyny and, and discrimination against women. We embrace healthy living in certain instances, but at the same time, reckless behaviors. Uh, around drug use and sexuality, et cetera. So, you know, we, we should be providing access from the tomb to the womb. Of course, our system doesn't always do that, but when, but I, and I could go about some other things, but I'm hopeful, and this is to answer your question, uh, Dr. Seal, uh, with every tragedy, there is opportunity. Uh, and it's been said in so many different places, but we should never let a crisis go to waste. And so uh, I'm hopeful because people are talking about health more. Uh, things like this symposium, this conference helps continue to percolate ideas, uh, create relationships and networks, um, uh, helps us form policy, all those types of things. Uh, we're able to use this time to educate ourselves, uh, particularly around this whole COVID-19 moment. Uh, for the church's part, uh, we are still a place of great influence, as Dr. Hankinson said, uh, that, that we can control uh, and can set the agenda uh, in our churches is one of the freest places that uh, we still have in America. Uh, from our message to our ministry that reinforces the mission we have been given, we have a great opportunity to reshape the narrative. And so COVID, tragically as it has been, it's affected us in so many terrible ways, yet it has given us, uh, the church, I believe, a window into the lives uh, of and needs of our parishioners like never before. Uh, 
from seniors to mental health to healthy eating. Uh, we have an opportunity to listen like never before but, uh, and become relevant, I believe, in the lives of our parishioners again, uh, because in certain ways we've been pushed out of the church to actually be the church. And so when we're on our digital platforms now, some of us still having services online, these are awesome places to harvest what are the real needs of your people. Uh, before now, it, it, we, we, we were always trying to get people to come to our stuff, get, come to our revival, come to our church, come join our ministry, come, 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 come. Uh, but now we're able to really have access into people's lives like we never have before. So I think this time is calling for a recalibration of how people, um, rather how the church provides ministry and adds value to people's lives uh, in so many ways. And, and so, like I said, we can leverage all of the various ways in which we're having to act now uh, for good health outcomes. And culturally, the black church has to shift from only fighting the last civil rights battles to the new frontier of owning the freedoms that we've won. Uh, whether that be healthcare, economics, or et cetera. So, so yeah, I believe that's that's those are some of the things that I believe we can get into. And quick example would be, uh, for instance, now that we're not occupying our building on Sundays, we're out on our corner just about every Sunday uh, distributing healthy food, masks. We're getting out messages of good health care. Uh, we're putting out messages of uh, wear your mask, watch your distance, you know, uh, uh, all those types of things and watch what you eat, stay out of the bags, uh, eat healthy, eat clean, eat good food to help boost your immune system. So it's given us access to, to be able to talk to all those things uh, while meeting the needs of our parishioners and becoming relevant again, I think in a whole, way, whole new way for our churches. Wow, thank you so much. So how does technology, Pastor Williams, how does technology play uh, in this with, in terms of the church and where we are going? We don't know when we're gonna come back after COVID, honestly, um, but, and there's still so much work to do, especially with our seniors. You know, um, what should, how do we move forward in this COVID with seniors who may not have access, who may not have people coming in? You know, uh, I take care of the elderly and some of them are depressed, you know, um, and because no, they, 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 are, they are very certain that they have to send their tithe in. They just want to, you know, they're only getting social security. They want to make sure they send that $50 in, that $100 in. But guess what? They're not getting a call from the church. They're not, no one's coming to knock on the door. So t talk to us about, you know, and COVID has, um, from, my, from my perspective, COVID has uncovered a lot of our successes, what's good about the church and what's not so good. You know, I love the church. I love the church. So therefore I can talk about the church because I love it so. But, you know, let's talk about, you know, some of the realities of our church and what we need to do. Talk to you, the brethren and the sisterin about what do we need to do around our seniors because our seniors, I believe, are being left behind. You're right. In, in so many ways, uh, Dr. Seal, you're right. Um, and and kind of as I was, as I was, as I was sharing, um, technology has uh, 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 can be a barrier, but it can also be a tool uh, to be leveraged. And so, for instance, when this whole COVID thing hit, all of our churches were completely caught off guard, and many of us were blindsided. Some had live streaming services, some didn't. Others had to ramp up out of the blue and create a whole digital ministry out of nowhere. Uh, and, and so what we, we of course, formed a, a, an immediate uh, PENAV emergency response team to look at all the various ways in which we would be able to respond to the issues that people were dealing with. And one of the interesting insights that someone uh, mentioned, because we talked about all those things about how to continue to reach our seniors, uh, make sure we, we have, of course, our small groups, our class leader system, we call it in Methodism, but others have small groups, cell groups, whatever they might be, uh, and uh, whatever equivalent that is. And so uh, we made a point, make sure your class leaders are calling all your members, staying in touch with 
uh, your seniors, making sure they have their needs, make sure they're getting prescriptions and doctor visits and uh, the groceries and all that kind of stuff. Who is helping out with all those things? Make sure you're doing that. Uh, we ramped up in all of those various ways. Uh, and someone said, well, let's make sure that after this, uh, uh, you know, this moment passes us by, we don't stop doing all the stuff that we started doing because COVID hit, you know, so uh, there, uh, and so to further kind of build on that point, uh, Dr. Seal, and, and how we can leverage technology um, through, again, those various ways help us uh, find out the ways in which we can meet their needs. And so some of our seniors are more low tech and may not be as technologically savvy. You know, so just the other day, we got a, um, purchased a phone live streaming service because most of our seniors or a number of our seniors weren't able to be watching the live stream because they don't have Facebook uh, or they're not on YouTube. Uh, and so we just uh, uh, subscribed to a service the other day um, that will allow just like when we go live on Facebook, um, they'll get a call on their phone and they'll be able to answer the phone and, and the service will be uh, on the actual phone line. Um, from our, our children, uh, we, we aligned all of our children to call our seniors. They picked a day and they had a list of seniors to call. And so they went through their list of seniors to call. Um, also, it's a great opportunity for young people to help seniors uh, learn how to use technology, a granddaughter, a grandchild, some someone in the house uh, to teach them how to get on Facebook or how to log on uh, to the, 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 the what we call our love stream. You know, so, 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 you, so there are many different ways you can do this, but uh, also there are low tech ways that you can reach, continue to reach your seniors. There's no problem in actually picking up a phone and calling. In fact, we also have a text uh, ser texting service where we can text people uh, in mass. We have a calling post system where you can call and it, kind of like a robo call, but, it, but it's actually my voice. I can re record a message to send out to people. Uh, we can also, uh, so that's a, an option. You have ways in which we can uh, actually write letters. It, people actually still do that and use snail mail, if you want to call it that. Um, there are ways that you can visit seniors from a distance. Uh, some uh, housing or or, or uh, uh, homes don't have, uh, people can't access them, particularly with this recent surge that we got going on. So that limits some of the exposure that we can have, but there are ways in which uh, we can still show up, drop off groceries, uh, drop, drop off messages, care packages we can send, all those types of things that we can still use to keep our, our seniors plugged in because you're right, they can get left uh, uh, by the wayside if we're not intentional about uh, reaching them in, in some of the, those ways. Dr. Williams, can you share that phone system again? Some folks uh, it's, in fact, it's phonelivestreaming.com. Um, you can go there, uh, phonelivestreaming.com. I guess we can maybe put it in the uh, chat box or something, and uh, that will be there, But and we could probably even include a link. You might want to think about them as a, a sponsor, if we're going to give them some free business. <laughs> I'm gonna get the hook up. So, uh, and this is this is so important because uh, technology, we have to master technology. We have a, a session, I believe, tomorrow on the black the black church futures around technology because in 10 years, uh, you know, we just don't know how this is gonna roll. I don't think we're gonna be where we were. We're gonna be in a new place. And we have to find ways of technology um, that's going to uh, uh, inter be integrated into our into our worship experience, not just on Sunday, but our everyday our everyday life. So, um, does any of the panelists have any any questions for each other before I open the get a question from the chat room? I, I got a question, if that's okay. Right um, yeah. So this is this is for this is for the good reverend. Um, you know, I, I think that something that 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 we struggle with, uh, those of us who are on the research side, um, is is just flat out reaching communities. We don't know how to do it, and there are so many researchers that will just that will they'll kind of they'll look up and they'll they'll try to connect with the first black church they can find, um, and we know that those connections are not always uh, good. They they don't always work for the church, um, but it's it's one of those things that we as researchers are are told to do. Um, I think a better way, a better way forward is to help the church with its aims, which is to create and sustain community, um, to help people uh, reach their spiritual goals, and to, to really, uh, you know, ensure that, that folks um, have a chance uh, to rehabilitate themselves, their mind, their body, their soul. 
what are things that we on the research side um, can offer uh, you know, black churches when we are, are trying to reach out and connect uh, with organizations like yours? What do we need to come to the table with in order for this to be uh, the right deal for you, the right deal for your, for your church, the right deal for your flock? A great question. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I think that uh, we're talking about kind of changing narratives and whatnot. I, I might uh, maybe um, uh, come from it from this perspective. I think that um, our parishioners want to be helped. They they want they they want to uh, share their story. They they want to uh, be regarded as human. They they want to be a part of you know all that's taking place, and and they want the bettering betterment of their lives as well and so uh, I, I think that one important part or beginning place would be to really partner with some uh, uh create some friendships with some pastors some lead pastors uh because one thing pastors can be somewhat um discriminating about who we expose our congregations to you know i don't let anybody just preach in my church uh you know there has to be some relationship some 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 uh, uh, sharing of ideas uh, 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 some common ground uh, with, uh, similar viewpoints of how we see life and ministry and so i think if you're able to have some researchers to uh, to really uh, uh first uh, connect with some pastors where a pastor can have some comfort level uh, and then feel good about uh, vouching for, because that's also important when a pastor vouches for uh, a person or a group or an entity or, or anybody that carries some weight. You know, so if pastor says, some people can say something all day long. Uh, Dr. Hankerson said that, you know, if I preached a sermon about mental health, some people would receive that better than even him, the good doctor who uh, is, is obviously uh, trained in the field, you know, but if, a preacher gets up and says, y'all need to go listen to Dr. Hankerson or yeah, we're gonna, all the church is gonna go uh, and we're gonna get some research done at Dr. Jack Jackson's spot and we're gonna, and pray the Lord, we're gonna have a, you know, a service and after service, we're gonna all go to get some research <laughs> and we get the bus will be full, you know? So that, that, that buy-in I think is important. Also, if you can integrate into the life of the ministry that the church kind of already has going on, I think that's helpful. So for example, I, I cited real quickly how we're often on our, just the block right on our corner after church on Sundays now, after we broadcast doing health, you know, distri di distributing food and, and information and masks and disinfectants, et cetera. We also, we also have a long prayer line that uh, forms down the street because before they can get the food and all the other stuff, they gotta let me pray for them. So when we do that, in the, and I'll ask, how can I pray for you? And they'll typically say, you know, my family, my mom, uh, my dad, he's sick, whatever. Some will even though say, you know, we will talk about, well, I'm homeless, I need a house. Some will begin to say, uh, well, you know, I have addictions, I need help with that. And because of some of those prayer requests coming out, we were then able to build on what we were doing by having some of our members of our church who are trained and and have who work for uh, healthcare providers that uh, can offer services around addiction and housing, all those things. And so I can then refer them right on the spot to somebody on that day to get some help in the community that they otherwise would have just got prayed for. So we believe fully about just doing more than prayer. We actually want to tangibly uh, be helpful for them. And so I think if you connect with some good pastors, well-meaning pastors, because pastors want the best for their congregations, uh, and then get the buy-in from a pastor, then vouch for the whole thing that you're doing, and then integrate yourself into the life of the church in terms of any other outreach things that ministries are doing. I think those can be really helpful. Uh, thank you. And I, I have a question for Dr. Hankerson as well. And I think this is inspired by a lot of the, the, uh, the chats uh, that I, I'm seeing coming in. Uh, so when you were speaking, Dr. Hankerson, you probably couldn't see the chats, but a lot of people are like, you know, I'm in this part of the country, I'm in this part of the country, I, I, I could really use these resources. And so, so obviously it's hard uh, for, for, you know, for folks like us uh, to kind of reach out and, and kind of pick up our practice or pick up our work and relocate it to other places. Um, but, you know, something that I have seen about the mental health care uh, field that has been exciting, something that you and I were talking about before we, we went live, is, uh, is, is sort of these peer support networks that are kind of growing up everywhere. You know, so these are, these are networks where, where individuals can support each other. They can get some, some basic resources. Uh, so, so, you know, for, for those people who don't know about it, it's, it's sort of like, you know, the way that we all learn how to do CPR 
Um, you know, there's, a, there's like a mental health equivalent of that that we can provide for each other. Um, do you have any advice for folks who, who may not be located as close to, to you uh, in Harlem where they can get services that they can start up their own uh, peer support network or, or something similar? Sure. Um, so I, and I, thank you for that question, you know, Dr. Jackson, and I did see uh, the question about mental health first aid. And so that was one of the first things that we did um, through our network of churches was to train, um, started with pastors and, and, and church staff um, and ministry leaders. And then we opened it up to the entire congregation. Um, and it was tremendously well received. And to your point, for those who don't know what mental health first aid is, it's basically the mental health equivalent of CPR. So it gives people the skills to be able to identify someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, it goes over what the signs and symptoms of depression, talks about trauma, it talks about substance use and psychosis. And then it gives people a five-step action plan about how to tangibly support someone in the moment. Um, just like CPR gives you the three steps of the ABCs of how to help someone who's experiencing you know, a cardio cardiovascular event. Mental Health First Aid was tremendously instrumental in increasing the awareness about, about mental health in our community, reducing stigma, and empowering people to be able to try to connect people to care. So um, if you just go to mental health first aid, I think it's .org, that will be the website for the national organization. All of the trainings now are conducted virtually um, just due to COVID restrictions, but that was really um, powerful for us. And there was a huge movement to your point about peers and really leveraging the trusted support of, of um, folks and folks network to be that bridge to professional care. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have uh, some some um, some questions and comments from the chat. Dr. Jackson, folks really, really want that email. They want and they want you to. <laughs> want All right, to, let me put that in the chat them, right now. Hold on. What you want? What the, what you want them to write? Put in the letter, and then they want to know what is an IRV. So you have three things. They want that email. Tell them what to say, and I'm telling you it'll work too because we used to do these kinds of campaigns. And what is an IRB? Okay, uh, so I just put my my email in the chat, jjackson31 at partners.org. Um, you know that is that is my direct email. Um, so just give me give me a couple of days if I don't respond to you. Um, but uh, you know I I promise that I will respond. Um, the the second thing is that if you are trying to to reach out and change the system. Um, I think Pamela Price uh, just dropped a, 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 a hyperlink uh, to the FDA. Um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which approves the drugs, and the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, uh, which conducts a lot of this health-oriented research, are always looking for guidance. Um, they always have uh, these, these opportunities where uh, they want people to weigh in and say, this is how this system, this is how this study, this is how this work should be done. Um, so I can, you know, if, if you get in touch with me, I can send you those. You can also look those up, uh, you know, on the FDA or NIH websites. Um, but if you are looking for, for someone to talk to, um, you might want to get in touch with your local institutional review board, IRB. Now, this is something that was developed in the late 1970s as a direct response to Tuskegee. And it is the cornerstone of all human subject research today. Uh, and you know, the, the reason why the system is so different now, uh, the reason why we don't have studies like Tuskegee that go on is because the federal government um, changed the game after the Tuskegee study came to light. Um, so institutional review boards are required by federal law to review the ethics of a research study. Um, the, the problem is that most of these IRBs um, are, are staffed by, by people like me who are in the research world um, uh, but they don't look like me, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so we, we need more community folks. We need more, you know, black and brown faces on these review boards. Um, but the review boards feel a lot like some of you feel on this call. They say, you know, we want more community members. We want more diversity, but we don't know where any diverse people are. And this is, this is a refrain that I hear every single day, uh, you know, at my job even though I live in a, a city that is majority minority and has been for 20 years, uh, people don't know where to go to find uh, uh, community members. So 
uh, unfortunately, you know, while while the 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 responsibility should be on us to go out and find, uh, you know, ordinary folks, uh, community members, um, we research scientists are not exactly famed for our social skills, so we don't really know where to go or or how to do that. Um, so we're working on it, and I'm I'm certainly running a bunch of studies to to help uh, facilitate those efforts, but. Um, what, I, what I would recommend is you look up your local Human Research Protections Office, so search for those terms, Human Research Protections Office, or the IRB, uh, and uh, get in contact with them about joining their ethics review boards. Um, because honestly, if you want the system to be different, if you want it to be fair, if you want to make sure that no one is getting exploited, uh, that is the best way to make a change. And, and everybody should be very, very close to a local IRB. They'll provide you with training. They'll provide you with a little bit of money. Uh, and you do get a say-so about whether research goes ahead or whether it needs to be modified uh, to be more fair and more equitable. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend that people get involved there. Uh, and again, if you look on the FDA or the NIH websites uh, and look for either draft guidance um, or uh, a notice, um, uh, there's a request for information. Sometimes they're called RFIs. Uh, a request for feedback, um, then you can weigh in on new initiatives that are focused on, on promoting health and wellness um, uh, at both of these two very large federal um, organizations. Well, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we are coming down to the, the last few minutes of this very, very, very important discussion, changing the narrative of Black culture, where we're going to be in, uh, in 10 years. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, I want to announce our virtual activities this evening. Uh, it's, uh, we have the Black Church Food Security Network will be with us at six o'clock and also Urban Cardio. Urban Cardio, you go that, back to the main lobby and hit virtual activity tab, okay? So I'm gonna close out by giving all three of you the opportunity just to give a closing word on the future, because this conversation is changing Black culture for the future. If you got to say one thing today, not one word, but what is that final message you want to give all 372 of us um, who found, who, who decided this was an important conversation because we want to change. We want to be in a different place in 10 years. Dr. Hankerson, I'm going to start with you. Then Dr. Jackson, I'm gonna give the pastor the last word, amen. So the thing I would say is, is let's get comfortable being uncomfortable talking about our emotions. I think our emotions have been such a taboo subject. Uh, we so oftentimes, unfortunately, think that depression is related to sin or because something my mama or daddy did um, or addictions are because of a moral failing. But mental health conditions are real illnesses that we are, are more likely to be impacted by because of all of the, the racism, the trauma, and all of the other stuff that we deal with as African Americans in this country. So let's get comfortable being uncomfortable and share our emotions and get help when we need it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hankerson. Um, my final word is, uh, the future is black. It, it really is. Um, if there's one thing that I've learned in the healthcare sector, the future is black. And now more than ever, these systems are learning that they need to involve us uh, and they need our voices in order to move forward, not just for our sake, but for the sake of healthcare. Uh, I, I won't get into the details of, about what I mean by that, but I mean it in a lot of different ways. Uh, but what that means is that we have an opportunity Either we can engage with this health system and this world and, and strive and center our wellness on our terms, or we can do it on their terms. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to emphasize the meaning not of trust because people often talk about trust in this capacity and I don't want to deal with trust. I want to deal with empowerment. And now is the time to take that power for yourself. Because if you have empowerment, if you have those knowledge and those tools, you ain't got to trust anybody. You don't have to worry about trust because you know how the system is supposed to work. We are at a very flexible time because of COVID-19 where the future can and must be black 
And we have an opportunity, all 371 of us on this call today, have the opportunity of shaping that in the image of what black health and wellness looks like. So if we can center that and we can do that now, we will be well by 2030. Thank you, thank you. And Reverend Williams. Awesome, uh, I, I would just say um, probably uh, this is a good carpe diem mo moment. Just it, it's time for us to seize the day, I think as the church. I, I, I mentioned some things in my comments, uh, particularly around not letting a, a crisis go to waste. Um, but this is the time uh, for us to really reevaluate and reimagine what ministry can look like uh, and to not be afraid of this time. Yes, I mean, there obviously with the coronavirus, there are some useful uh, fears that we uh, need to be able to use to conduct better behaviors. But uh, in the sense that uh, this is a time for us to, to really uh, use this moment to reshape what kind of church we're gonna be going forward. Uh, the church that existed before COVID will not come back. There will be some people who have adjusted to this online platform of ministry that will aren't gonna come back into the building. Um, it may even be longer for some seniors to get back and feel comfortable coming back in the building. And I think this is a great time for us to just, just to reevaluate what the church is because the church is not the building. Uh, you've heard it said in so many different places uh, that the church has left the building or, or that the doors are closed, but the, but the church is still open. I mean, there's a million different ways to say it, but this is the time for us to uh, move beyond the encumbrances of, of being bogged down in the ways that things used to be. Uh, when tragedy comes, it's a good time to recalibrate what you're doing, uh, to re be reminded what you got in it, of, uh, what you got in it in the first place to do uh, and be about accomplishing those things. Uh, and this is proof because all of us have had to change in so many different ways that change is indeed possible, that when you have to, you will adjust. And so this is one of those moments for us to seize the day uh, and be uh, uh, the beginning of what I believe a new church, a new black church can look like. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to the a great panelists. Thank you to all of you who came by and shared. And, uh, and thank you for attending at the Healthy Churches Conference. This is day two. And we have two more to go. And we have one more session after this one. I do believe, uh, and then our evening activities, and then we will see you in the morning. But before morning comes, we have to go through the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Pastor Williams. Thank you, Dr. Hankerson. And thank you, Professor Jonathan Jackson. Love you all so much. We're out. <laughs>